Welcome to today's webinar, Attendant Applications from Jammer Hunting to Signal Rejection and More, brought to you by GPS World Magazine and our sponsor, Navitel. I'm Joelle Harms from North Coast Media, Senior Digital Editor for GPS World, and I will be your event manager. Before we get started, I want to let you know that today's webinar will be recorded. You are currently in a listen-only mode. A recording of this webinar will be posted to gpsworld.com slash webinars and will also be emailed to you tomorrow. At this time, I'd like to acquaint you with the ways you can participate in today's presentation. Please notice the Submit button in the lower left-hand corner of your console. Just type in the text box at the bottom left and click Submit to place your question in queue. We encourage you to ask questions throughout the presentation. We will address these questions at the end of the presentation during our Q&A portion. If you experience any technical difficulties during today's event, you may select Help using the yellow question mark button for a page of frequently asked questions, or you can also use the Q&A box to submit your issue, and Assistant Producer Allison Barwatz or I will personally assist you. Our Twitter feed is placed on the right side of your screen. You may also use the hashtag GPS World Webinar to submit any questions during today's webinar or to enter into discussion with other attendees. You may learn more about our speakers by viewing their photo, bio, email, and Twitter handles in the upper left-hand corner of your console. If you are logged into your social media accounts, you can share the webinar's title, description, and URL with friends or colleagues on popular social media sites, all within the Share This widget. Now I'd like to turn today's event over to our moderator, GPS World and Geospatial Solutions Group Publisher and Editor-in-Chief, Alan Cameron. Thanks very much, Joelle. And welcome, everybody, to the February webinar, Antenna Applications from Jammer Hunting to Signal Rejection, sponsored by Novatel. Uh, this, uh, this month's webinar coincides with the publication in this month's issue of GPS World of the antenna survey, the GNSS antenna survey, a complete listing of all the essential specifications on the GNSS antennas currently on the market. It's in your February issue. If you haven't received it already, you should very shortly. And it will also be available. The survey will also be available online. The antenna survey spans about 20 pages of uh, near minuscule type. There's a lot of data packed into that. So when you're selecting a GNSS antenna for your application, that's an essential guide. Uh, as I said, uh, the uh, today's webinar and the antenna survey itself are both sponsored by Novatel. Novatel manufactures and provides a number of high precision antennas and there's a there's a, a very useful guide to antenna selection actually it's called selecting the right GNSS antenna which is part of the survey uh, part of the antenna survey in the February issue and in it uh, Novatel covers such basic questions as what GNSS constellations and signals do I want to receive? What amount of antenna gain do I need? Why is element gain so important? How important is antenna beam width and gain roll off? What is noise figure? What is VSWR or voltage standing wave ratio? Why should I be concerned about multipath rejection? And I see from the questions submitted by those of you attending the webinar that multipath rejection is indeed a prime concern of many of you. Uh, what is phase center stability? And why is it important? And finally, uh, perhaps most importantly, what are the key requirements of my application? And in this kind of primer about selecting an antenna, uh, Novatel goes over some, some key considerations to, to ask yourself about your application. And then there's a very handy chart of desirable features uh, broken down by application. For instance, survey, GIS, reference station, aviation, marine, construction, precision agriculture, and so on. Uh, overall, it's a very useful document. And uh, we put a lot of work into assembling the antenna survey itself, gathering all the key specifications about 20-plus uh, uh, technical uh, measurements or specifications of each antenna. And there are upwards of two or 300 antennas listed. It's just a, a testament to the, 
the diversity uh, in the marketplace today and in the applications. Okay, now to turn to today's webinar, we have two uh, researchers talking about uh, their specific applications of antennas to to do things, to do specific things. Now, traditionally in the GNSS context, antennas have been omnidirectional and one uh, might be uh, tempted to think of them as somewhat passive. Oh, they gather the signal, they pass it on to the receiver, which does the actual work. Now, directional antennas, of course, have been around for a long time. Uh, in the GNSS context, they're, they usually are omnidirectional, have been. But uh, in today's uh, webinar, we're going to speak with, or you're going to hear from, two researchers who are using antennas in specific ways to actually um, accomplish some of the work uh, in their in their projects and in one of them the antenna is actually functions as the main sensor for the work described now today we're going to hear from Adrian Perkins from Stanford University who's going to talk about jammer hunting with a UAV and on board the UAV uh, there are some antennas that he'll tell you how, how they use those antennas for specific functions. And then uh, after him, we'll hear from James Curran from the European uh, Commission's uh, research, uh, Joint Research Council, uh, talking about uh, signal rejection. We'll return after, uh, after our two speakers with a question and answer period with your questions, some of them uh, submitted beforehand, and of course you can submit questions during the webinar itself. I'll turn the floor over now to Adrian Perkins from Stanford University. Adrian, take it away. Thank you, Alan, for the introduction. Um, so today I'm going to talk about uh, antenna characterization for UAV-based GPS jammer detection and, and actually a little bit about the, the localization that we're doing uh, to be able to find these jammers. So to motivate the problem a little bit as to why we're interested in localizing jammers, we're going to look at kind of an age-old example, if you will, of uh, a jamming event that happened at Newark Airport. Um, it was caused by passing traffic on the highway in these very localized GPS jammers. Um, and the, the problem has since been resolved, but it paints a very interesting picture of what can happen when you start getting jammers that, let's say, are a little bit bigger than what sits in your cigarette lighter in your car, and what the impact can be if you have a well-placed jammer. Let's say something that's a, a couple miles down the runway on approach, um, you can all, all of a sudden wreak a lot of havoc on uh, incoming traffic and impose kind of a security concern uh, for commercial aviation airports, and that's obviously something we want to avoid. Um, so we want to be able to localize these jammers quickly when, when, they, when they arrive. Um, there have been some existing work on how to find uh, these jammers. There have been, in the past, uh, kind of manned ground-based and plane-based solutions, um, but they face two big problems. One, they're, they're pretty time-intensive and they're costly. Uh, the, the cost, you can imagine straight away, I mean, they're, they're manned solutions. The plane-based, you've got to have a, a fixed-wing aircraft out there, um, and, and that definitely has associated costs. Um, and, and some of the challenges they faced is the fact that uh, for the ground-based solution, for example, it, it can be faced with multipath as the signal is bouncing between all the buildings around the airport, uh, which just increases the complexity of the problem and the search time. And then for the, the plane-based solution, uh, it has a challenge of the coupling of the motion and the measurement. Um, and what, what it was, the design was that there's kind of a patch antenna that sits on the top of the airplane. And in order to detect a jammer, it's got a bank and therefore turn the plane. And again, this is just, it adds a complexity, a, another degree of, of freedom that you've got to kind of uh, worry about when you're trying to find these jammers um, that we want to be able to avoid. So our solution is we're creating something we're calling uh, Jaeger, uh, Jammer Acquisition with GPS Exploration and Reconnaissance. And there's a, a couple pictures of Jaeger. And, and what Jaeger is, it's designed to be a fully autonomous UAV uh, that'll be able to rapidly localize the source of a GPS jammer. Uh, and in order to, to kind of figure out how we want to uh, localize that jammer, we've got to talk about the, the algorithm that's going to do that localization. That's going to be the, the key element behind. Uh, and that framework we've chosen to model this problem as is what's called a partially observable Markov decision process. Uh, and what that is, it's, it's a model that's uh, used uh, more commonly now for real-world sequential decision-making problems. Um, so what it does is it, it allows us to find a, a near-optimal solution of how to get to a given reward 
which in this case is, is finding the jammer. Um, so imagine here's kind of a depiction of our world. Uh, that white triangle is, is Jaeger, the red X is the true location of our jammer, and, and the black is our view of the world currently. Um, and, and in this framework, the first step is we've got to discretize some of this. You know, instead of working in the whole frame, let's, let's work on a grid. And then we're going to use observations to start uh, making decisions. So for us, the observation is what's our bearing to the jammer. And, and that observation allows us to make these belief distributions. So here you can kind of see an example of what that belief of where the jammer is. Uh, so you can see we're, we're in that grid world. The dark cells is where we think the jammer is after just that single observation of bearing to the jammer. And the lighter the cells get, the less we think it's there. And what the POMDP allows us to do is it allows us to close our navigation loop now around this belief distribution. So now we, we've made this observation. We have this belief. Where's the next best place to make an observation to continue to reduce the belief till we get to a certainty of where we believe the jammer is? Um, so you can kind of start seeing here the key kind of element, uh, the, the key decision part of, of this problem is what's that observation model look like? Uh, for us, the observations are bearing, but how, how precisely can we get that bearing information? Uh, and how robustly can we get that? That's going to be critical to our, our decision-making process here, and that's, that's what uh, the goal of that antenna characterization is for. So on board Jaeger, what we do, what we have is we've got a, a single directional antenna. Um, it's got a, a pretty decent gain. It's got a 60-degree beam width. Um, so just for, for those who, who may not know, uh, the beam width is going to be the, the width of that main lobe in the front there, on, in this case kind of on the right. Uh, and you can see a, a picture on the top right is kind of the manufacturer spec, uh, and, and on, the, on the bottom it's kind of test pattern we've created. So you can see, you know, that there's, it, it uh, looks pretty good to what the manufacturer sent us, and you can see that directionality to it. Um, and now, so, so every measurement we're going to make is going to have these gain patterns. So we need to be able to way to, to tease out what's the bearing from that pattern. Uh, and that's what we're, we're, we examine three different ways of getting that bearing. Uh, the first is just simply looking at the maximum. What's the maximum point along the curve there? And we're going to say, hey, that's along the front. That must be our bearing. The second method we're going to use is something called cross-correlation, where we're going to take our experimental gain pattern, so the one we just created, and we're going to match it to this truth. And we're going to uh, kind of rotate the truth until they align, and that's going to be the bearing we measure. And then finally, it's, uh, the third method is an improvement on the max method. We call it max 3, and it's where we're looking at the, we're going to try and find the, the minus 3 dB points, so that's where the main lobe starts to taper off a little bit. Uh, we're going to find those, we're going to take the midpoint of that, and we're going to call that the bearing. Uh, there it's intended to smooth it a little bit. Um, so we did a, a round of experiments at um, something called the Joint Interagency Field Experimentation Event, uh, GIFX. It's at Camp Roberts in California. And we brought out Jaeger with our directional antenna. And we set up, uh, unfortunately, we can't jam GPS uh, whenever we want. So what we're doing, we did all our experiments with Wi-Fi as a proxy for GPS. Uh, now, in terms of the actual framework, the methodology of localizing the signal, whether it's a Wi-Fi router or a GPS jammer, uh, the method is the same. Things that change slightly is the exact characterization of, of the patterns. Uh, but a lot of what, what I'm going to talk about um, is still very valid with GPS. So I've broken this into two sections here that I'm going to talk about is the measurements we made to do the characterization, then I'm going to show you some, some of the, uh, the success we had with the, with the POMDP. So when we went out, we made uh, 88 different uh, gain patterns at a range of different distances. So here in this picture, you can see the jammer is somewhere in that middle cluster there. Uh, we made measurements all the way out to about 350 meters away, way out to the right there. Um, and they're colored by the signal strength. Um, and this kind of illustrates two interesting things. First, we get the question a lot, why not use signal strength as a metric for distance to your signal source uh, in, on top of bearings? So now you have two kind of inputs. And, and I think this picture demonstrates that very well that it's, uh, signal strength is not the most accurate and reliable method for distance metric. If you kind of go around the same radius of the jammer, you'll go from green dots to yellow dots to green dots to yellow dots again. So um, it, it's not really the most re reliable metric for distance. And then the other thing you can see here is there's this tight clustering near the jammer that all of a sudden you go from green to, to really red measurements. So we're getting very poor signal performance. Um, and that's actually, that was intentional. Uh, that's a function of how we've mounted the antenna on the vehicle. Um, so it's got a 60-degree beam width on that antenna. We've 
knocked it down about 30 degrees on, on the vehicle. Um, so we've got this cone underneath of this null region. And our, our goal here was that this null region gives us no measurement, uh, which is a lot of information. So we've broken down all our measurements into three cl classes. Close, anything where we're above, anything where that jammer's in the null region. Ideal, and that's going to be anything up to about 200 meters. Anything beyond that's far away. And that really just came down to what the, the sensitivity of the receiver we were using. Beyond 200 meters, uh, signals got pretty weak. Um, and actually, you can see here uh, some of the gain patterns we produced at far away. So here it's 250 and 300 meters away. Uh, and in the top right there, you can see what the gain pattern, the ideal gain pattern looks like. So you can see we, we've lost a lot of information. Um, what's interesting to note here is the MAX methods, both MAX and MAX3, are still able to, to get a lot of information uh, out of the little bit of data, while cross-correlation really struggles because, it's, it's, again, it's trying to match against the known pattern that doesn't resemble anything like this. So it, it starts to struggle at those far distances. When we look up close, uh, we were hoping to get basically no measurement, but we actually got these very noisy uh, patterns. Again, it looks absolutely nothing like the ideal pattern. And, and our measurements are kind of all over the place. I would have never guessed that the true bearing is that, that red line. Um, and just by chance on this one, MAX3 did well, but for the most part, uh, it was all pretty random. And then in the ideal case, so this is something that's about uh, just over 25 meters away, you've got this beautiful pattern. It really looks like what we're looking for. Um, we're able to, with all three methods, do, do very well. So that's just an example of what the gain patterns were looking like. So to talk a little bit about the performance of the three different methods on all the patterns. Um, first, to just look at that error distribution. We're, we're looking for something that's a little Gaussian, as, as we'd expect. And, and uh, you know, it's very noticeable here in the overall case and in the ideal case. We do get that. Uh, but in the near case, it's, it's pretty noisy, um, which, which makes a lot of sense with the, with the measurements we were able to get. Um, overall, uh, it, it does seem that cross-correlation fares the worst, and, and MAX does a, a little bit better. Um, but that's, that's really uh, as a, a fact of the MAX did pretty well at the far measurements. Um, so, you know, looking at that ideal case, uh, MAX and cross-correlation were pretty, MAX3, sorry, and cross-correlation were pretty much the same, uh, and they did uh, significantly better uh, than MAX. And, and in the close region, it's, uh, it's everyone's all over the place. So when we're looking at it as a function of distance, uh, it makes it a, a little bit easier to see. Um, the max, if you, you can see, it's, it's pretty spread out. All the measurements are very spread out, uh, while the cross-correlation has got a very tight grouping. Everything's pretty low, uh, with the exception of maybe the, those two outliers of the, the far region. And then max 3 looks uh, a little bit like that cross-correlation. It's got the, the edge on cross-correlation at, at that far distance. Um, you know, one thing that we found that was very interesting is that MAX method, it's by far the simplest, and that actually ended up hurting it a little bit because the patterns we, we get aren't perfect. We're not going to get these beautifully smooth front lobes, so what ends up happening is these imperfections trip up that MAX method. Uh, so in this case, you can see there's a spike off to the left, uh, and MAX just locks on that. Uh, and that's why we, we developed this MAX3 method, and that allows us to, to basically do a smoothing because you're trying to find the drop-off points it allows to smooth out some of the effects of those bumps and gets you a much more accurate bearing measurement, as you can see there. Um, so that's just a, a little bit on, on the characterization that we did uh, to be able to, to get more information to, to give to our planner. Um, and the next thing I want to show is, is some of the, the results we got on demonstrating the, the feasibility of this POMDP-based approach. Uh, so first, we needed a baseline. And so what we did is we, we went out um, and we took the, the jammer and Jaeger and we did a greedy approach. This was the jammer's in that direction, so let's move forward, let's make another measurement, and, and let's get there. Um, it takes about eight steps to find the jammer in this case, uh, and, and there is a user in the loop for this. So it takes about four to get to the jammer, and then another four of Jaeger crossing itself for a user to say, hey, you know what, I'm pretty sure we, we found the jammer, it's right there. Um, so that's our baseline. We're going to say we want to be, we're trying to do better than this with the POMDP approach. Um, so to walk you through some of that POMDP approach, here you can see, so here's our, our grid world. We've got Jaeger starting off in the center, and this is after our first measurement. So we've made our observation, and this is our belief distribution. Um, now, as, as we move forward, the, it's going to make a decision uh, to go to one of these dark red cells where it thinks the jammer is. And I have to say that, that these tests were done before we did all the, the, before we got the characterization information. So it's still working under the assumption that when you're directly over the jammer, you're going to get no measurement. Uh, and that's what it's trying to do. It's trying to get directly over the jammer 
uh, because that'll give it a lot of information if, if that's true. Uh, but what ends up happening is uh, it makes yet another measurement. Uh, it sees, it finds a new location, a new belief, um, makes yet one more step, uh, and then makes its final measurement and says, hey, I'm pretty sure I found the jammer. It's in this spot. Um, and now as we look at this, the, the, it is one cell off. Um, and some of that's due to that noisy measurements that it's getting. But when we're looking at it, it's a, a two-step approach. It made you know, two, two steps, uh, and we'll call a step a, a motion and a measurement, um, and it's fully autonomous. So we just said go, and you know, in, in about five minutes it said, hey, I found the jammer, it's in cell X, Y. So now to kind of combine bringing in back some of that characterization we did, what kind of improvements can we expect when we start using the information that we know about the antennas now. Um, so the improvements we added, the fact that we normally get 13 degrees of noise, roughly. Uh, and when we're close to the jammer, we're looking at something that's more like 40 degrees of noise. So we're no longer on the assumption that when you're close, you get nothing. Here, when you're close, you just get a very noisy measurement. So we're back to our world here with, with Jaeger in the middle, uh, our, our jammer, that red X up top, and we're, we're not too sure where anything is. Um, as usual, we make that, that first measurement looks very much the same. Uh, and as we take that first step is where we start to see a little bit of differences. It's backing off. It's staying a bit further from the jammer. Um, and as you can see, uh, it'll make yet, yet another measurement in the simulation. Uh, and and um, this is a, another step where you can all see all of a sudden it's not going to those dark regions. It's staying far from the jammer. And that's because it now knows when you get up close, uh, you get very poor performance. Um, so it makes one more measurement. Uh, I think it's going to take one more step here, yet another measurement, and says, hey, I'm pretty sure I found the jammer. Uh, it's, it's in this spot. So in this simulation, you can see maybe we sacrificed. We have an additional step in our process here compared to, to the run that we did uh, that, that I showed earlier. Um, but we've got much better accuracy or, or apparent uh, much better accuracy on finding the jammer. Um, and that's where it kind of goes full circle in terms of that characterization is key uh, to be able to get our planner to do to do its best performance. To wrap things up here, you know, we, we were able to develop up of this PUMDP planner that's able to do rapid localization of our signal source, and we demonstrated that feasibility of it through flight testing, and then brought in that characterization of the antennas uh, to improve that planner even more. Uh, and as we move forward with this project, some of the improvements we're, we're looking at is, you know, can we get that close range bearing to be significantly better? Um, that planner, can it start? Can, can we get it to, to be even faster? But also looking at different antenna types, things like beam steering antennas or direction finding antennas, which is a, kind of an example there uh, where you got a nice null in the middle to, uh, to, to try and get your bearing information. Um, and, and of course, the, the next big step is also moving to, to using GPS instead of Wi-Fi uh, and do all these tests again. Uh, so with that, thank you very much. And back to you, Alan. All right. Thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, we'll we'll turn to questions at the at the end of the webinar after we hear from James Curran. And I just want to tell all our listeners that Adrian's material and James's material, both both these presentations, well, they will be available for download. Uh, the the webinar content will be available for download 24 hours uh, from now. Uh, tomorrow, so you can refer this material to any of your colleagues who you think might be interested. Uh, access will be free, and you can download it yourself for reference, and you can pass the link on to uh, to to your colleagues uh, for their benefit. Also, the material uh, appears in written form in the February issue of GPS World magazine. Uh, Adrian's material is the cover story antenna characterization for UAV jam UAV based jammer hunting and James's uh, article is the innovation column in the February issue moderated by Richard Langley uh, null steering antennas assessing the performance of multi antenna interference rejection techniques so you can get this uh, information in three ways while well, you're getting it now uh, live uh, you can download the webinar later. You can provide the link to your colleagues, and you can refer to the February issue of the magazine to get it in all its um, all, all its detail with all the charts and graphs and uh, and written commentary.
All right. Now we're going to go to James Curran, who's speaking to us uh, from way across the Atlantic uh, in Italy, where he works at the Joint Research Center for the European Commission. James, tell us about your work. Thank you, Alan. Um, okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, nose clearing antennas, um, how they make them work, and what factors make them work well, and, and what factors tend to limit their performance. So it's a, a little bit back to basics. Um, I'll try to briefly run through the basic concept and the physical element itself, and then ways of combining signals to deal with the presence of an interference. So in this case, we're acknowledging that interference is present, so how do we deal with it? So no steering, it's, it's not a very new idea. Uh, it's been around for a long time in a lot of systems, a lot of frequencies. Um, maybe known in other domains as zero forcing precoding, um, and very similar to beam forming, but uh, it's about destructive interference as opposed to constructive interference. And so the basic principle is that you have not one antenna element, but you have a couple, uh, and they're nearby, and they each see the same ensemble of signals arriving, those that you want and maybe one or two that you don't want. And the idea is that they're close relative to the range to the interference, um, but they're far apart relative to the wavelength of the signal. So you talk about the signals maybe having the same group delay, but different phase delays. Um, the idea is that this forms some sort of orthogonality in the phase domain. So just to point out what it's all about, uh, we imagine this simple scenario here on the right where we have a two-element array, um, and then we have two signals, one we want, A, and one we don't want, B. And so you can imagine these signals as being bandpass processes, so narrowband signals somewhere up at RF. And w what you'd like is that if you arrange the spacing of your array well, um, that when these signals arrive, they look like copies of the same signal, but rotated. And this rotation has something to do with the angle of arrival. In this example here, we have a broadside signal A, which arrives an, an identical copy one at each receive antenna. And we have a, a signal B at an oblique angle, which arrives delayed to one by delta T and uh, prompt to the second. And so if you simplify things, if the signal is narrowband enough and your antenna spacing is right, you can say that you have a copy of A plus B, and then at the other element, antenna element, you have A plus a rotated version of B. And so simply, you rotate the second copy and add the two uh, received signal ensembles together with the hope of canceling one and preserving the other. So in this really simple case here, if we take um, the second antenna element and rotate all the signals by pi and add it to the first, we should reject A while preserving a bit of B. And conversely, if we rotate by an angle proportional to the delay, the extra delay that B experiences, in this case, omega delta T, we should reject the signal B, place a null in that direction while preserving A. And so that's what it's all about. And the question here is really, when we go to do this, when we go to implement this function, this combining function C, how do we do it? And how is the way we do it going to affect how well we can reject the signal? So a little look at the parameters. We have what we call a, a steering vector, which is a phase rotation, e to the i phi, and a scaling, kappa. When you want to place a null in a particular direction, you might choose phi to make sure that you get destructive interference at signals arriving from that direction. As you vary phi around that point, you see your null moves to a slightly different direction, so perhaps you don't reject as well in the direction you want. And as you vary kappa, you scale the depth of this null. And there's a little example here. If you look at the uh, red signals, there's a solid red curve where we pointed a rejection right at B, and we fully nulled it. And we get a very sharp, deep null. As we vary by a little bit, we see this null moves away. But in the direction we're interested in, the uh, actual rejection we got is closer to only minus 7 dB, so not a lot. As we vary kappa, in this case, if we're off by about 20% in our, in our gain factor, again, our, our null goes from minus infinity, theoretically, up to about minus 7 dB. The green curve, then, is the signal we want. Through all this, even though our null depth has varied massively, we 
effect on the signal we want didn't change that much. It was about half a dB. We see we get a theoretical maximum of 3 dB if they were orthogonal at 90 degrees. If they're a bit closer, we don't get quite so much gain, but we don't reject it either. So it's kind of interesting to see that beam forming, the maximum gain you can get is linear with the number of antennas, and it's not that much. Whereas no steering can be very powerful, but it, it's quite sensitive to these steering parameters. And so that's what we're going to look at a little bit now is how sensitive are they and how good do you need to be? Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the um, phi, our phase steering, is a function of the spatial separation of the signals arriving in our antenna. If the transmitter is at far away, so 20,000 kilometers for a GPS satellite, or maybe tens or hundreds of meters for a jammer, free space loss will affect the gain arriving, the gain of the signal arriving at the antenna. But across the array, across a couple of lambdas, it's not going to vary that much. But phi will, will change. And the spacing of our antenna elements is typically lambda over four to lambda over two. So we will see a phase change. So what else affects kappa? Why do we need to scale our gain? And the answer is we have got many different antenna elements, and each of them have their own unique features. They maybe have slight imbalances in the gain pattern and we need to accommodate that. So to go right back to the very first principles, we thought let's have a look at the antenna and see how this affects the whole story. So how do you look at an antenna? How do you look at an antenna array? One way of measuring it, a uh, very simple way, is to just look at it as a two-port network. So if you have one very well-characterized antenna, um, standard gain horn or the likes, and you have access to some anechoic chamber or somewhere where there isn't a lot of reflections or multipath, you can simply take a network analyzer and, and look at the scattering parameter S21 of your antenna and your standard, your known gain pattern, and uh, get a good picture of the gain and phase variation across azimuth and elevation. So we, we tried this. We popped a, an antenna array into a chamber and had a look at a two-dimensional mapping of gain and phase um, by examining S21 across the band of interest. So the array we were examining kind of uh, has lived multiple lives. It started out, we were thinking about doing reflectometry. So the array is a seven element hexagonal array. Each element is a dual frequency, L1, L2, um, dual polarized element, LHCP, RHCP. So in this particular case, we're only looking at the L1 RHCP. But, um, it's a slightly more complicated setup. We looked at a 180 scan of elevation and um, 360 in azimuth in steps of about five degrees across 100 megahertz at L1, 201 points, so every 500 kilohertz. Um, because we wanted to scan everything together, we had to multiplex through each element of the array. So if you look at the bottom figure there, bottom photograph, you'll see the array is attached to a a hardware or a switch. So it's multiplexing through each element of the array one at a time throughout the scan so that we could get a two dimensional mapping of S21 for each element, uh, for each frequency, for each uh, an elevation. So here's the, uh, the chamber, the uh, antenna in situ. It's a 20 meter diameter anechoic chamber. And the uh, antenna there is on a tripod mounted on a rotating pillar. So we could keep the transmit slide constant and rotate the pillar to get an azimuth scan. So what did it look like? When we had a look at the absolute value of the uh, S21 parameter, we were able to put together vertical cuts and horizontal cuts of the antenna. So what we're looking at here is a vertical cut along zero degrees of azimuth for two different elements, the center element and one of the peripheral elements. And the bottom plot is a horizontal cut at an elevation of about 40 degrees. So what's interesting is that the uh, two different elements have noticeably different gain patterns. So even though the signals arrive from a 10 meter distance at the array at the same azimuth and elevation, and the antenna elements themselves are the same, the gain we see, the effective gain we see is different. Now, this is a function of proximity to other antenna elements and proximity to the edge of the ground plane. And perhaps it's not the best designed array, uh, but it's just an idea that even though you have nominally identical elements, they're not perfect, they're not isotropic, and the gain pattern themselves 
plays into what you're going to see when you start to steer a null. So I know people have mentioned this funny looking plot before. Now this is just an idea of a projection of this into three dimensions. So um, it's the same information as you've just seen, but a 3D plot of linear gain for each of the elements. And it's quite clear there that gain of the peripheral element is deflected and it's attenuated relative to the center element. So it's not ideal, but we can still use this to steer beams and, and place nodes in certain directions. Okay, so that's gain. Now phase. Phase is very, very important because this is the parameter that should be distinct for different transmitters. This is the bit we play upon when we try to place a null. So your S21 is a complex number, so if you take this number and look at the argument of it across a, a vertical scan, you get an idea of the phase center variation. So the upper plot here you see is a distinct trend in the antenna elements, and this is a um, geometric range because the antenna elements, are uh, antenna elements are offset relative to the center of the antenna array. As you scan across elevation, of course, you, you change the geometric range and you see this as a phase. Canceling that out, uh, correcting for that, you see the lower plot, and you see quite a bit of phase variation. Ideally, this should be constant, this should be a straight line. It's, it's not quite ideal. In fact, there's a fluctuation of about 10 degrees here. So to put it in context, um, a geodetic antenna, this would be a degree or less. And here it's 10 plus or minus 10 degrees. So this is important if you're trying to steer a null in a particular direction. You need to calibrate out these. Of course, if you're doing adaptive steering, it's not so important. OK, so we have an idea of now what the gain in phase looks like. But we haven't really figured out how well we can null a signal. But under ideal conditions, if we know all our parameters and we, we've calibrated everything out, how deep can we actually null a signal? So we decided about measuring this, measuring this while avoiding all um, non-ideality. So we did it in a very controlled environment inside an anechoic chamber using two signals, which were very well known and very well behaved. So we used two CDMA signals, broadcast them for spatially separated transmit led and set about nulling one and measuring the residual power. So we simulated uh, synthetic CDMA signals with 10 to the 9 chips, so we should have good separation between the two signals. And uh, because we transmit them perfectly synchronous, we could actually track one with using a modified GNSS receiver and use it as a pilot signal to observe the residual power on the second after we place the null in that direction and have a look at, okay, under perfect conditions, how deep can this rejection be? So here we see uh, a little plot of what's the best we can measure and how sensitive it is to these steering parameters. And it's quite interesting. Depending on the SNR of the received interference, we have a varying certainty about what its actual amplitude is. And therefore, we have a varying certainty as to what the value of kappa should be. Similarly, if it's a stronger signal, we can really have a stable estimate of the phase and steer a phase and, um, and null in that particular direction. And it, as it gets weaker, as we move more and we have more uncertainty as to what the steering vector should be, we get less rejection. So the best we managed to measure was around about 90 dB. Under more realistic conditions, we see this falls away quite fast to 60, 50, 40 dB. But it's still quite significant. 40 dB is a, is a lot of rejection. OK, so this is under ideal conditions. Now, this isn't very practical. We can't expect to live in an anechoic chamber. So in the real world, we have to do something a bit more adaptive, a bit more coarse, um, a bit smaller, lighter, faster. And, and how, how is this going to affect how well we can reject an interference? OK, so implementing this combining function. There's two ways that we looked at, and maybe there are more. But uh, the two we looked at was analog combining and, and digital combining. So in analog combining, you do it an RF or maybe an IF. And you take analog signals and you use a solid state steering of phase and an attenuator. And then combine them and just look at one combined signal. So that's the upper picture. In the lower picture, you maybe digitize these signals uh, at IF. And then in software or maybe in hardware, you can, use, you can do a combining. One of the key differences, of course, is that both digitizer, you can form many nulls and, and run many beams. Whereas when you do it with solid state electronics, you have to use one entire set of circuitry per um, control radiation pattern. OK, so I'm lucky enough here to uh, work with a guy, Michaela Baber, maybe some of you have heard of him. He um, makes a lot of this kind of hardware. And uh, he built two nice little pieces of circuitry that we used to, to experiment. 
So the upper one is a, a bank of phase shifters and attenuators. And we used this in some of the experiments sometime last year. Um, they're pretty wide band, one one and a half to two and a half gigahertz. They can handle a lot of power, so up to about 25 dBm. And they use a digital control of phase and of gain. So in this case, the early experiments were done with 0.5 dB steps of gain and 22 and a half degrees of phase. So it's relatively coarse. And so the question is, if we have very coarse steps in phase and gain, even if we know what kappa and phi should be, we can't necessarily steer exactly to that. So how will that affect the, the nulling performance? So our first step to, to checking this was, was brute force. Let's broadcast a very strong tone at an array, try to combine the signal from two elements, and permute through all possible gains and phase and see what the best rejection we can get is, simply measuring it with a power detector. And this is what we saw. And this is a brute force through the surface. And you see, when you start getting close to placing a note, the uh, response is quite sharp. We saw upwards of about 20 dB, not the 90 we were thinking about, maybe about 22 or 3 dB there, um, relative to plus 3 dB, or minus 3 dB of rejection, or 3 dB of gain when we were actually enhancing the signal. So we looked at this for a little bit and thought, okay, why, why are we seeing a lower rejection? Can we have some sort of figure of merit that we can, we can look at and say, okay, if I want to reject this much, how many bits do I need in, in gain and phase? And one way of thinking about this is, is imagining the uh, steering vector in the complex plane, which is what you see here on the right. And in the complex plane, it's digitized, it's uh, discretized in phase and in gain. And so the particular plot here is actually three bits of phase. We used four bits, but it's a, it would be a very busy plot. You can also imagine then, if the transmitter was at any arbitrary location, that you have a uniform error in gain and phase. So regardless of what phase comes, you end up rounding your steering vector to the nearest point in this complex plane. What's the residual error? And geometrically, it's quite a, a nice little problem to solve, and, and it solves that quite easily. And so you get a nice closed form, which tells you the rejection you can expect, the minimum rejection you can expect, and the average rejection you can expect, given um, a certain resolution and gain in phase. So it's a nice little design rule. If you need 30 dB of protection, what sort of um, phase shifters and attenuators do you need? And it creates a nice little uh, surface you can examine. And one other interesting thing that you can see is that there's no point in having very good gain control if you don't have commensurate phase control and vice versa. So you tend to see saturations of this curve in two different directions. And interestingly enough, uh, around about um, the point of the six and four bits that we used, you do see it's around about 25 dB rejection, so pretty close to what we observed. Okay, so that's, that's analog. What about digital steering? This is quite different. Um, in this particular case, we assume we're doing everything in software, so our steering vectors are near perfect, they're floating point, we have arbitrary position steering. And the limited, limitation in this case is the digitizer. How well can we represent the signal? So you can see this in the little equation bottom right. We're trying to steer digitized versions of the received signals. And they're digitized on two different digitizers, so they're not going to be exactly identical anymore. And how does this affect the rejection? Okay, so again, into the echo chamber and do a few tests. And once again, use some of uh, Michaela's hardware. In this case, we have two quad channel, channel front ends. Uh, we're digitizing at 8 bits at 2.5 megahertz complex. And so we're looking at a synthetic uh, GPS L1CA like signal and a CW interference from a spatially separated transmitter. Okay, so before we went anywhere, I thought, okay, what do we expect? What's going to be the problem here? What potentially is going to hamper the rejection we see? And, and the answer is really, it lies in this expression here. It's the difference between digitizing a rotated signal and rotating a digitized signal. They're never going to be exactly equal, except, of course, in 90-degree rotations. Because it's complex uh, digitization, they will be identical. But everywhere else in between, they won't be. And you have a finite quantization error. And this quantization error is going to be the leak through the bit that you couldn't reject. So you can come up with a rough idea of what sort of rejection you get versus the number of bits you use to digitize, assuming, of course, your AGC is working perfectly. 
And so it ranges here from as low as 4 dB up to about 18 dB for 1 to 4 bit. Kind of getting at the same notion is that when we try to reject a signal, when we try to null a signal, what we do is we, we cancel the common part. We hope that the interference appears somehow similar on both antennas. And the common part, that similar part, is what we can cancel out. And so covariance, sample covariance is a good way of estimating how similar these signals still are. When there's no interference at all, we have two copies of thermal noise. They should be independent. There should be no covariance. And as this strong interference begins to appear, we should start to see correlation between the two sample streams. And this is the, this is the power that we can cancel out. This is the interference we don't want. As this interference gets very, very strong, of course, this cross-correlation should go to unity. But when you don't have enough bits, when you don't represent the signal well enough, this um, correlation coefficient begins to saturate. You see this bottom right. For one bit, it's quite severe. And the more bits you introduce, the closer this gets to unity, the better we can reject. So where does this other power go? We, we start off by injecting a lot of interference, bring it at an antenna. They, they all see pretty much the same signal. We digitize them, and suddenly, the common power disappears, and we can't cancel it anymore. And, and so where does it go? And it's a little bit obvious. Uh, it, what, what's happening is you're saturating the signal. And when you saturate signals, you tend to get harmonic distortion. And so what's happening is we, we clip or saturate the signal, and we introduce tones and harmonics, and, and our interference power is spread across the spectrum. And when it's spread, we can no longer rotate them all at the same time back into phase. And so you can see this here on the right-hand side. The top plot, we have an interference. And the next row down, we, we combine them in, with uh, full resolution, floating point resolution. You see we can reject it very well. And as we reduce the number of bits, 4, 3, 2, and 1 bit, we see that we start to introduce harmonics. And as we reduce the digitization levels, we get stronger and more harmonics. And, and this hampers our ability to reject the signal. Again, you can look at it in another domain. You can imagine bit error rate, which is usually a nice way of measuring um, performance and interference, because DNO estimators tend to get biased in the presence of strong interference. And so you can compare it yet again. You can say, well, if I have a one-bit receiver or a two-bit receiver, and I'm experiencing very strong interference, what does my bit error rate look like as a function of JN0, or jammer to noise ratio? You see this in the bottom plot. You see two, three, four bit receivers do pretty much OK. They do about the same. And the one bit receiver is doing about 2 or 3 dB worse. As you introduce two elements, both employing the same digitizer, and you steer a node towards the interference, you see a gain for the one bit receiver of about 5 or 6 dB. For the two bit, it's about 10 dB. And three bit, it's more again, up to about 20 dB for the four bit receiver. And so it's a, a way of examining, OK, if I want to have 20, 30 dB of interference rejection using two elements, it looks like I need to be using five, six, seven bits in my digitizer. OK, so that's kind of a wrap up. Um, what can we say so far? You should be able to do very well with two elements. You should be able to reject a signal um, quite a great deal, 40, 50, 60 dB if you do things right. The implementation of your null steering is the limiting factor. For an analog null steering technique, it's down to how well you can steer phase and gain. And you should be careful, really, to choose the steering circuitry to be commensurate. There's no point in wasting effort and power and silicon and money on phase steering if you don't have good gain and vice versa. For digital combining, it's pretty obviously down to the digitizer. But typically, you're looking at four, five, six bits or more to get anywhere near 20 to 30 dB of rejection. Okay, and uh, that's about it for me. Um, back to you, Alan. Thanks very much, James. Uh, we'll turn now to questions from the audience. Uh, we're going to go first with a set of questions to Adrian about the UAV jammer. And James, in the meantime, uh, while Adrian is answering his questions, if you look at the, the back channel, you'll find uh, I've prepped you with a couple of questions that listeners have directed to you. And I want to remind both our speakers that if, if you want to go back to in answering a question, if you want to go back to a slide in your presentation to illustrate a point, just select it in the, in the top band there and then 
push in the preview band and then push to audience and that will bring the the display back uh, to to that slide all right for Adrian uh, here here are a couple of questions that come in have come in from the audience first of all what method are you uh, now now you explain that uh, that for the purposes of this experiment you jammed on Wi-Fi uh, because it's illegal to uh, jam uh, GPS, uh, but uh, imagining a, a situation, a real-life situation in which GPS was being jammed, what method are you using for autonomous navigation of, of the Jaeger when uh, GPS GNSS is being jammed? Yeah, that's that's actually really the the other major component of Jaeger is is that autonomous navigation in the denied environment. Um, and for that, our, our right now, you know, if those experiments we were using GPS as our truth for navigation and all that. Um, our our view is we're going to use uh, signals of opportunity. We're targeting using, uh, you know, implementing this near an airport where we're we've got a wealth of signals, whether it's um, you know your your cell phone network, uh, Wi-Fi that's out there, um, or even the, the signals that you can find at airports themselves. So so localizing based on those signals allows us to be able to take our, our reliance off GPS. Um, and so far, we've gotten some pretty good results on, on being able to get decent accuracy of position um, using the, the just FAA signals of opportunity. Um, and again, since we're discretizing our world into grids, it's okay if we have some uncertainty as long as we can place ourselves within a certain grid cell. Um, so we don't need the most robust solution. We just need a solution that gets us within grid cells. Well, that's interesting because uh, as the the February issue is out with uh, with this material in it, uh, I'm working on the March issue of the magazine, which is about uh, navigation using signals of opportunity uh, in GPS challenged or GPS denied environments. So all our readers out there look forward to the March issue signals of opportunity. Uh, another question for you, Adrian. What if there are other sources of interference in the vicinity of the target? That's the way that one listener phrased it. Another one came at it slightly differently, but basically the same question. How do we deal with the problem of having multiple static jammers? And this listener refers to the problem of a ghost solution. Right, and, and that's, that's definitely a, an interesting problem once you start getting multiple of them out there, and, and let alone, you know, if they start moving, that's yet a, an even more complex solution. But what's nice about the POMDP framework is that while we're doing all our testing right now, assuming just one signal, single jammer, uh, it, it's able to adapt with multiple jammers. So all of a sudden, you know, if we think back to that belief distribution, you're going to get something that, that's going to have uh, uh, multiple different cones uh, so actually, actually, just to, to bring that slide back up. Um, so instead of something that, that looks like this, we're going to have, let's say, a, a cone off to the left that mirrors this one or, or somewhere else. And the, the beauty of using this POMDP framework is that it's going to be able to make those decisions as to where's the next measurement location to make uh, to resolve the position of more than one jammer. Um, so right now, while we've done all our testing with just one, uh, the complexity definitely does increase with using more than just one. Uh, but the framework is able to support multiple jammers. So it's it's scalable in, in that sense. Yes, yes it is. Yeah. All right. A couple of questions for uh, James now. Uh, someone wants to know, does the multi-element nulling cover multiple, frequency, multiple frequencies simultaneously? Ah. <laughs> um, yes and no. The problem with um, multiple frequencies is that the phase observes at different elements um, changes with frequency. So for one particular direction of arrival, there'll be a common delay across the array. But as you vary the frequency, you see a slightly different phase. So it's not true that a, a null pointed in a given direction at L1 will point in the same direction at L2. In fact, it will probably be 30, 40 degrees rotated with respect to that. So when you have very far away frequencies, you need to place a second null. Also, with a, a second effect there is when you look at relatively broadband signals, this inherently hampers the nulling depth. So if you want to null a tone, you can get arbitrary depth nulling because the phase will be common and there will be a fixed single phase which completely cancels out a signal. Um, as you broaden that signal, 
a phase rotates across the bandwidth, and so your ability to reject is averaged across um, a varying sweep of phases, and so the, the effective nulling depth to produce is very important for very broadband signals or for split spectrum signals, um, high order box signals. We have another question for you, James. If the antenna beam is narrow beam, how are multiple satellites tracked? Oh, well, they're not. Um, so that's uh, beam forming as opposed to null steering. Um, there, there simply aren't. If you reduce the beam, you reduce the gain in that direction and you don't see them. Um, so in that case, you're probably better off with the uh, digital beam forming or null steering such that you can form multiple beams simultaneously and process them separately. Of course, it's not as simple. You can't feed it directly into a standard receiver as you can with the analog case. In, in this case, you must point a beam in the direction of each signal you want to see individually. Um, unless there are special cases where perhaps a uh, timing receiver can survive well with reduced visibility or reduced constellation, although they're probably very special cases. And then looking further, uh, well, look, looking into the future as the uh, all the GNSS uh, constellations increase, and we're looking at uh, anywhere from 75 to 100 or possibly more GNSS satellites. How is that uh, in, in orbit and, and transmitting and, and on multiple frequencies on top of that? Um, how is that going to affect the picture? Will, will having all these satellites, uh, is that going to help or hurt in, in this methodology, well, in this application? In this case, it certainly can't hurt. Um, the, uh, ex the extra multi-axis interference from a dozen, two dozen more satellites is going to be nothing compared to an interference, of course. Um, the benefit might be that it might be possible to null out large portions of the sky and not have to worry and not have a significantly reduced um, positioning accuracy, not really affect your DOP so much. Um, although 25 satellites in the sky, probably you're seeing 20 at a time, it's going to be great. Uh, there's a limit to how much of the sky you can block out. Um, realistically, if you're going to point a couple of nulls in a few directions, the, the net effect on the, the visible sky is going to be quite small. All right. Uh, we're nearly out of time for our webinar. I want to thank both of our speakers, Adrian Perkins from Stanford and James Curran from the European Commission. I want to thank our sponsor, Novatel. And again, if you refer to the February issue of GPS World Magazine, you'll find the GNSS antenna survey with complete specifications on hundreds of antennas. The antenna survey is sponsored by Novatel, and you'll find a primer in the first pages of the survey about uh, considerations for selecting the right GNSS antenna. I want to thank you, our audience, for attending this webinar. Uh, be, uh, be alert for the registration for our next webinar. It, uh, the registration page should be posted within a day or so. Our next webinar is going to be on signal simulation. It's on March 10th, and we'll have a couple of other webinars coming up in very short order. Uh, following that, one on, well, we have three scheduled. Uh, coming up very quickly. One on timing aspects, that'll be in late March. Uh, there will be a UAV webinar in April and another on um, using handheld receivers and, uh, and in conjunction with cell phones to get uh, survey grade results. And then in uh, late May, we'll, we are looking at a another uh, UAV webinar. UAV is being a hot topic these days, naturally. Again, thanks to both our speakers, Adrian Perkins and James Curran. Thanks to Novatel, our sponsor. Thanks to Joelle for manning the controls on this webinar, and I turn it back to you, Joelle. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Yep, thanks again, everyone, for attending our webinar and to our sponsor, Novatel. Uh, just a reminder that a recording of this webinar will be posted to gpsworld.com slash webinars 
and will be emailed you, to you tomorrow. Uh, the dates for the webinars that Alan was mentioning are listed um, on that webpage, so feel free to visit there. And um, thanks, thanks for watching.